Andrea, uh, we are going to start. I'm just uh, explaining uh, in uh, brief uh, how uh, we met and you know how this cooperation um, we offered and we initiate to do this collaboration further after we did. this is just a try out but what is interesting that university universitas sumatra utara uh, we have the dean of faculty of um uh public health here with us she was also the the host for this program that's why the uh, students are you know it's more than we expected to attend but uh, according to uh, the uh, plan that uh, our university is trying to expand, uh, you know, in the area of uh, public health, but in the law faculty, you know, so it's not attached to the uh, public health uh, faculty uh, per se. Uh, without due any uh, further, I will give the chance uh, for you to speak, but Dr. Devi, uh, who is a program secretary for our PhD in law program, will be a moderator and as as well as um a person who's going to you know uh chair or lead the discussion with your presentation uh ibu devi the floor is yours and then uh mind you that there will be questions uh you know raised during the session thank you thank you uh prof ning room uh, okay uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, selamat sore, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian. Pada hari ini, saya akan pertama-tama saya akan menggarisbawahi dulu aturan main. Ya, pertama, tolong jaga uh, mic-nya, matikan mic-nya, karena kita akan bertambah orangnya ini. Uh, hukum kesehatan kelas hukum kesehatan di Fakultas Hukum sendiri itu lebih dari 300 orang. Belum lagi yang dari FKM, jadi banyak ya. Tolong bantu mute kan uh, mic-nya masing-masing. Nanti sejalan dengan penjelasannya, apabila ada yang ingin ditanyakan, silahkan menuliskannya di kolom chat ya. Bisa dalam bahasa Indonesia, bisa dalam bahasa Inggris. Oke. Okay? Paham ya aturan mainnya ya. Sebanyak, sedapat mungkin tolong hidupkan kamera kalian karena e, untuk sebagian dari kalian yaitu dari hukum kesehatan dan dari S3 ilmu hukum ini adalah e, kelas pengganti. Oke okay ya. Baik. Good afternoon Andrea. This is the first time for us to meet, isn't it? So well, I've been from... Zoom meeting before to discuss about this. Yes. Um... So, uh, Andrea, Dr. Andrea Gideon is, um, as you know, students, uh, has been a faculty member at the Universitas Liverpool, the English, and also National University of Singapore. Jadi, di Inggris dan di Singapore. Uh, she has also been appointed as a non-governmental advisor to the International Competition Network by the Competition Consumer Commissions of Singapore. And now a visiting researcher at the University of Malaya as well. That's her brief uh, short bio that I have to, uh, that I need to inform you. Now, today... Uh, Dr. Andrea is going to talk about competition in healthcare, in health service. So for us, uh, we need to know, is there a competition within the health service? Yeah? Okay. The floor is yours if you want to share. Uh, you Do you want to share it by yourself, the screen? Or... Uh, yeah, I can share it in a minute. Okay. I just wanted to briefly say hello as well. Um, or in Indonesian, I can say, um, terima kasih. <laughs> uh, selamat sore. Um, saya dulu tinggal di Kupang, di NTT. Um, uh, jadi, uh, bicara uh, bahasa Indonesia sedikit. <laughs> but not enough to do my presentation. So apologies for it being in English. <laughs> Um, I will now share my screen, but thank you all very much for joining. 
Um, okay, let me share the let me share the slideshow. Um, okay, I hope everybody can see that. Okay. Um, so um, talking, I'm going to talk about the competition in the healthcare sector in the EU and the UK. And of course, um, this is now different because you will all know that we have Brexit and the EU, the UK is not in the EU anymore. Um, instead, it's um, completely separate now. So until um, the 1st of January 2021, um, the two systems would have been together and the EU system would have, of course, um, influenced the UK system. So we can talk about this as, as one thing, but now they've gone separate ways. So I will talk about the UK quite separately. Um, so I don't know how much um, you all already know about the EU. Um, so I'm going to just say a few words. Um, the EU is, of course, a supranational body of um, 27 member states, and um, the, it's it's a bit like ASEAN, but it has much more powers to make supranational legislation and um, to actually investigate from the competitional perspective. Um, the authorities at the EU level can investigate in the country, so they can actually come in and do dawn raids or interviews and, and so on. Um, so it has quite a lot of power compared to, for example, ASEAN and can actually sort of um, interfere, if you want, in, in the national law. So, um, and I'm particularly going to talk about the competition law because we want to know about competition in the healthcare sector. And um, competition law, EU competition law, is applicable to national healthcare system if they are undertakings, what we call undertakings, which essentially means that they're a business, but I will be talking a bit more about what exactly that means. Um, and like I said, the, the, the UK is now separate from the EU, so we will be talking about that separately. I'll um, start with talking about the EU competition law and how it may or may not influence national healthcare. Uh, so in um, EU competition law, um, we have certain aims and the way that it always started was market integration. So um, the EU actually has the legislation for the member states uh, that they cannot impose any kind of barriers to trade within the internal EU market. So they, for example, can't put any customs duties or um, restrictions on the numbers of goods that can go from one country to another. Um, so, and um, that would be not much use to have um, this prohibition of restrictions from the state side, if then the companies themselves could set up barriers with, um, between the member states. So therefore, the competition law is kind of um, the other side of the coin to the free movement law that we have um, to create the internal market within the EU. Um, there are more um, aims to um, competition law. Um, it's of course also effective competition, um, but then also competition law doesn't exist in a vacuum. So um, the other more general aims of the EU, for example, public health or environmental protection, should to a certain extent also play a role in competition law, um, even though they not, may not be the primary aim. Um, however, since sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, the Commission has followed what is called a more economic approach and become more um, a bit more American style, relying on economic analysis and le been less considered of other aims, such as um, healthcare, for example. And new questions, of course, also arise with new technology, um, so with new digital technology and so on. And we also have questions, for example, of human rights issues like data protection. Um, so this is all um, questions about what the exact aims are in, in EU competition law and then how far for our case, aims such as having good healthcare systems can play a role in competition law. Um, so 
the competition law for those, because I know there are people from the public health background who have perhaps not done so much law yet. So brief introduction to competition law. Um, the competition law in the EU basically has four areas. Um, that is the prohibition of anti-competitive collusion. So collusion between um, the companies. Um, the prohibition of abuse of a dominant position. So if we have a company that is in a position of extreme economic strength, then they can just um, act however they want. For example, they can't just abusively raise prices. In addition, there's the prohibition of state aid. So the member states can't give money to um, companies selectively um, to put them in a better position because that would obviously also cause unfair competition. If, say, for example, Spain would give a lot of money to a particular company, then that company has an advantage when it competes with companies from um, other member states that do not get such uh, money. And then we also have the merger control um, so that companies can't just merge however they want to. Um, if the merger is particularly big and might have an effect on competition in the internal markets, then the commission can review that. And um, all these uh, um, pro prohibitions have what we call direct effect. That means that they are directly um, applicable in the member states. So uh, in within the member states, um, that the member states don't need to make a national law to implement this EU level law, but instead they work directly in the member states and they can be enforced directly against companies. Um, we find all these prohibitions mainly in the primary law and the treaties and, and in themselves, but also in some secondary law and um, regulations and directives, especially in the merger regulation and regulation from 2003. Um, so the EU competition law um, has several organs. Um, of course, the Council and the European Parliament, they make some of the legislation. And the court is the judicial body, so they will review the cases. Um, first, the <laughs> first, the general court, and then um, the Court of Justice as appeal court. But the main organ that we look at in competition law is the Commission of the European Union, um, who are enforcing competition law and who can um, do the investigations. And like I said, even dawn raids and and interviews and ask for evidence and who eventually issued a decision which can be quite high fines. Um, in the Google case in 2017, it was more than 4 billion euro fines, so they can actually hurt. Um, in addition, we have the European Competition Network, so that's the national competition authorities working with the EU competition authorities together um, to enforce competition law. Um, so this just as a little background of what competition law is, but what is particularly relevant for us in the context of um, healthcare and whether competition law is applicable to healthcare is this notion of undertaking, which I had briefly mentioned. So um, competition law in the EU context and indeed in the UK context as well, they use the same notion and um, indeed in Singapore as well. So this notion is quite widely spread. Um, competition law applies only to undertakings. Now, undertaking is a bit of a funny term because in normal English language, undertaking is usually an activity. But when we're talking about competition law, undertaking refers to usually to a company. Um, and that comes from the German word unternehmen or the Dutch word on the naming um, that they basically translated sort of a bit haphazardly into English. Um, so this word undertaking sounds a bit strange in English, but um, it usually refers to companies, but, um, and that's what's relevant for us in the healthcare context, not entirely. Um, so the word undertaking is not actually defined in the treaties itself, but in case law, and it was defined in the case Hafner as every entity engaged in an economic activity, regardless of the legal status of the entity or the way in which it is financed. So it doesn't matter if the company has legal personality, whether it's a private business, a third sector business, a public um, agency. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, financed from public funds or um, however it is set up. 
all that matters is, are they conducting an economic activity? And the term economic activity itself is defined as offering goods and services on a market. Um, so that then raises the question, because it, they don't actually have to offer the goods and services on a market. Um, it is even if they could theoretically be offered on a market. And that then raises the question, is there anything which not cannot at least theoretically be offered on a market? Um, so here, if we take the example for sport, um, then it's not on a market if it's just your neighborhood team playing football together. But as soon as we're talking about organized sports, in particular, um, the FIFA um, commercial football, that is certainly an um, economic activity. So um, every, every activity basically could potentially be of an economic nature, really. But there are two situations which I recognize as always non-economic. The first situation is the exercise of sovereign power. So we're talking about um, acts by the government that are part of official authority and in the state's prerogative. So um, this doesn't mean that everything that the state does is out of competition law. Like I said, the state um, and public institutions can well be within competition law. Competition law can be applied to them. But if it's something like, um, I put the picture here of air traffic control, um, harbor services, but also passport services um, in a compass case, um, where they were de doing data sorting to issue passports, these are all things that are of official authority and they are non-economic. And therefore, um, when the state is conducting these activities, they do not fall under competition law. And the other one, which is interesting for us today when we're talking about healthcare, is services governed by the principle of solidarity. So here um, we're talking about national schemes that usually have an element of cross-subsidy. So what that means is if we're, for example, considering German public health insurance, which I think is kind of similar to what you have introduced in Indonesia um, more, more recently, um, it is that everybody... Um, basically comes off your salary automatically. You can't not pay in. Um, and how much you pay in entirely depends on how much you earn. So if you earn very little, you only pay very little into the insurance. Um, but if you earn quite a lot, you pay a lot into the insurance. But at the end of the day, everybody gets the same out. So everybody gets the same services. Everybody gets to see the doctors, gets to see the specialists. Um, and they, they don't have to pay in addition to what they already paid into the insurance. So um, this is the cross subsidy. The richer people kind of support the, the poorer people because everybody pays different amounts in according to what they can afford. But they all got the same out. Um, so it is disproportionate to the risk and the benefits as well. So here, again, um, older people or people that already have some kind of illness um, will also pay the same in as young, healthy people, even though um, they might sort of cost the insurance much more because they might need to go to the doctors much more. So everybody um, gets the same out at the end of the day. It's disproportionate to any kind of risks or benefits. Um, the, the only, what it only depends on what you pay in is your income. And these schemes are usually of a public nature and they're compulsory. So they're administered by the state or um, there's a law that sets certain companies in charge of administering these, these schemes. And they're compulsory, like I said, this money comes off your um, salary automatically. You can't opt out because otherwise it would obviously not work if all the very rich people or the young healthy people opt out then um, we only have very little money in there and the people that need a lot of health care will take all the money out and and it will basically the, the scheme will go bankrupt the financial equilibrium of the scheme would be threatened um, so that's where they have to be compulsory and if we have such a setup um, of, of public insurance, or it doesn't have to be an insurance, it could also be like in the case of England, but also Spain, um, the, the healthcare system is funded from taxation. 
Um, if we have such a such a setup that has these elements of cross subsidy, compulsory, public nature, etc., um, then that would not be of an economic nature, and it would not fall under competition law. But the distinction is sometimes tricky because um, if one of these elements is missing, for example, the compulsory element or the public nature, um, it might be possible that it is then not seen as governed by the principle of solidarity. And in that case, it does fall under competition. So the, the line is sometimes difficult to draw. And um, the more market elements are introduced into a system, um, the more likely it is that it will not be seen as governed by the principle of solidarity, but instead as economic and therefore competition law um, applies. So in the past, first um, competition law was applied to public services like utilities and postal sectors, which traditionally were also seen as, as something that the state should be doing. Um, but with increasing privatization, um, competition law was applied to these areas. And um, more recently, it has become more and more that competition law has also been applied to more social areas like healthcare or education, for example. And like I said, the more market elements a system embraces, the more likely it is that competition law applies. Um, the Commission has made that quite clear in a decision in 2006 where they said, um, it's an involving concept linked in part to the political choices of the member states. So if the, they make the political choice to introduce market elements, um, then the activity in question can become economic. And um, in that case, it falls under competition. <laughs> um, to just make it a little bit more complicated than it already is, um, the concept of undertaking is also relative. So that it means that not everything um, that an entity does is necessarily an economic activity. So the entity is not necessarily an undertaking entirely, but it might be an Something undertaking like and fall under competition for some aspects, but not for others. So here, um, an example from the healthcare section would be the case of Ambulance Glockner. And here, uh, the um, emergency services that were conducted um, to bring people in an emergency quickly to the hospital um, were seen as non-economic activities, but the patient transport, if the patient is stable and fine and just needs to be brought from A to B, almost like a taxi, a taxi with a bit more medical provision, um, that was seen as an economic activity. So the the ambulance, uh, the ambulances, um, basically going out and and moving people around, um, was not always necessarily the same. Part of this was an undertaking falling under competition law, and part of it was a non-economic progress. Um, so that and that's um, finally. So we we've seen it is relative. Part of it might fall under competition law, part not unless the activities are inseparable, in which case they have to be considered together. So here again, an example from healthcare is that um, the case of Penin, which was about the Spanish um, healthcare service, which is a service funded by national taxation and free at the end of the delivery. So everybody gets free healthcare and it comes from the taxes. And um, Obviously, they needed to buy things like bandages and medicine and so on to be able to perform that health service. And the question was, is the, the purchasing, is the buying of the equipment that they needed, is that a non-economic service or not? And the part here is that, that buying something to conduct the non-economic service is intrinsically linked. So you can't conduct any kind of medical care without first buying the things that you need. So therefore, these two activities are linked and um, they are both seen together as non-economic in this particular case. So um, this is obviously kind of tricky to differentiate and um, the... Uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, as we say, like the, the devil lies in the details. So we really have to focus on the details to um, figure out whether or not something is an economic activity or, or not. And that can be quite tricky in particular in cases of healthcare. So there have just recently been some two new decisions, the Irish Age case and the Dovera case. 
And um, this whole notion of that the solidarity based system is non economic was kind of drawn into question in the what, what Irish, Irish age case. Um, but uh, the court uh, in the Dovera case, it was similar again, but the Dovera case was appealed to the court, um, unlike the Irish age case. And um, the court here made very clear that. Um, the non-profit uh, area, area, anything that is based on solidarity, is out of the regime of competition law. So um, they uh, confirmed the previous system, the previous differentiation of solidarity-based activities, not economic, um, non-solidarity-based activities as part of competition law. And um, that is kind of the main crux with competition law and healthcare at the EU level. So as soon as um, healthcare is provided in an economic fashion, which um, some countries have moved towards, England has in particular, but they're obviously not in the EU anymore, but also other countries like the Netherlands and so on have moved more towards um, economic-based systems, private, more privatized systems. And if they do that, then EU competition law applies. And then naturally um, everything they do can be scrutinized. So if they form any kind of agreements between the hospitals or hospitals and um, GPs, hospitals and phar um, pharmaceutical companies, any kind of agreements that they form are subject to scrutiny. And um, so they couldn't, for example, fix prices at a lower level to um, help the patients that would uh, be anti-competitive or a particularly dominant um, hospital couldn't sort of, um, let's say, uh, raise prices to a higher level to sort of subsidize research or whatever, um, because that could be potentially anti-competitive. Equally, if two hospitals wanted to merge, um, that would be subject to um, competition law. So um, there's a whole variety um, of things that could be scrutinized. And um, possibly one of the most important areas this, this has become relevant in is the area of state aid. Um, that means that if a hospital is publicly subsidized, but they also offer services to private patients, then they have to make sure that they use full economic costing so that they really charge the full price, including overheads and everything. Because otherwise, if, they, if they're charging a price where they kind of use the rooms, for example, for free, um, then that would be subsidizing the private healthcare and that would be considered state aid. So again, then they could fall under Excuse the EU competition rules. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry to cut off, but just to make, to for us to understand the healthcare system in UK, I think it's quite different than us in here, isn't it? In Indonesia, I mean. Yeah, uh, I will. I will go to the UK healthcare system in a minute. Okay, I was just, uh, first talking about the EU level. Yeah, um, yeah. So, what? Uh, and the next minute, I'll come to the UK level because obviously the UK is not in the EU anymore. But what I've been saying so far applies to countries like Germany, the Netherlands, Spain, and so on. They all have to be careful that uh, they don't fall under competition law because then um, the what they're doing in the healthcare sector will be scrutinized and um, they can't basically do whatever they want anymore. So the EU okay. level, because the EU rules overrule the national rules. Um, so if they're doing anything that uh, infringes EU law, then um, basically they can't do that anymore. Even if it's foreseen by national legislation or anything, it is not possible because the EU law overrules the national law. But um, yes, for the next section now, I'm, I'm going to Ooh. talk about the UK. And as you said, the UK is indeed very different from other countries, for, like different from Germany, but also different from Indonesia or, or Singapore. So um, the background to this is that um, Basically, uh, public service sectors, including healthcare, were um, often provided by the state. The same as in the UK. Since 1948, uh, the uh, healthcare in the UK was um, pub made public. It was provided by the state. And like I said, um, already the uh, healthcare is funded by general taxation. So we don't have to pay into an insurance. We don't have to pay for the services that we receive. 
Um, they just use the taxes that we pay anyway, and they provide the healthcare for free. So if I go to the doctor, I don't have to pay anything. Um, and it was public hospitals and public GPs and so on that provided this free healthcare for um, since sort of the 80s, 90s. And with the 80s and 90s, um, privatization took place and they wanted to make it more commercial. Um, but the problem here is, of course, that um, public service markets are not normal markets. They don't necessarily function as if we are just selling, I don't know, radios or, or um, TVs or something. They had There are certain additional needs attached to it, things like trust and the healthcare provider, um, geographical coverage. You have to make sure that everybody can access healthcare no matter where they live. Um, you have to make sure that healthcare can be accessed equally and not just for the rich and, and so on. And so these are not normal markets. Um, so the privatization can be a bit problematic to an extent. Um, so therefore, what they introduced in the UK is sector regulators for um, competition within these sort of privatized public service markets. They don't um, quite governed by the normal competition law, but they have specific sector regulators. And I have listed them all here. So um, we have a specific sector, sector regulator for gas and electricity, because that's obviously also a public service market, not a, a privatized market for water, for aviation and so on. But for our purposes, most importantly, we have NHS improvement, which is um, the sector regulator for healthcare. Um, at the same time, the Competition Act 1998 also applies to healthcare as well. And this is what we call a concurrency regime. So both the Competition Authority, the CMA, the um, Competition and Market Authority, as well as the sector regulator, the NHS Improvement, they are both responsible for competition in the healthcare sector. And um, so generally, they kind of try to work together. So um, the uh, regulators will agree who has the authority to act, but the competition authority has the power to sometimes take a case over if they feel that there is not enough um, activity by the sector regulator. And um, in the past, so I would say up until about 2019, um, there was not much activity by the sector regulators. They did not encourage competition very much. Um, and that has then been a bit more um, sort of pushed, um, especially by the, by the Competition and Markets Authority, um, so that they be a bit more active and make, a bit, make sure that the competition in their sectors is working better. Um, so, yeah. The, like I said, this concurrency regime of them both working together started off a bit slowly um, It picked up a bit more. We've seen a bit more enforcement. There were more warning letters um, and the collaborations between the sector regulator and the competition regulator has also picked up. Um, so to focus back directly on the healthcare market, um, so the healthcare market basically, as I explained, um, is largely this free market where, uh, sorry, the, this, this, this free provision, um, where we pay our normal taxes and we just get free healthcare. And this is traditionally all provided by public providers. And then always next to it, there was a smaller um, market for private healthcare. So people, everybody had to pay the taxes. So everybody could use the NHS, the, the National Health Service, if they wanted to. But um, if somebody really wanted to go to a private provider, that was also possible if private providers were available. So for example, here in Liverpool, um, there are virtually no private providers available. So you have to go to the public providers, whether you want to or not. Um, but in, uh, in bigger places like London or Manchester, you also have more of a private sector of healthcare providers. And um, so for the private sector, you just pay them for the services that you receive. It's an entirely commercial transaction um, where, that you just go, you get your treatment and you pay while the NHS was entirely free at the point of delivery. But um, that would be relatively simple if it, if it was just that. 
But um, there was increasing reforms from the 1990s onwards um, towards marketization also within the NHS. So for example, the NHS could now, um, your GP identifies what you need, um, but then they could send you to a private provider to actually receive that. And the private provider would then be paid by the government from the taxation. Um, so the separation between the private and the public side of the healthcare has kind of become very mixed with this increasing privatization reforms. Um, these privatization reforms, um, like I said, started from the 90s, but they have um, uh, been further taken forward in the Health and Social Care Act 2012, and then again in the Health Care Act, um, Health and Care Act 2022, here with a more focus on integrated systems. And um, healthcare then also became formally part of the competition authority's um, interest set, like next to the sector regulator NHS improvement. So now what we have in the healthcare market are basically four scenarios. So we could have that um, the public healthcare um, is sort of provided by the public provider and the public pays for it, scenario one. That is quite straightforward. I'm staying entirely within the public system. Then we have scenario number two, where I'm in the public system. I go to my GP as, as the public provider, but the care that I then, the, for example, the secondary care that I need to receive is then offered by a private, private provider, but the public provider pays for it. So I still don't have to pay anything. That's scenario two. Now we also have scenario three, where I go to a private provider where I do have to pay, um, but the private provider doesn't have a certain uh, sort of service available. Say, for example, they don't have x-rays. So they sent me to a public, the private provider sends me to a public provider to have my x-rays taken. But because I've started off as a private provider, I now actually have to pay the public provider um, because I'm in the private field of healthcare. And if the um, public provider offers such private healthcare, um, that means, as I explained previously, they have to, for example, offer it for full economic costing. So they wouldn't be able to um, subsidize the, the private part of what they're doing with, with the public part. So they have to keep it completely separate. And then number four, that's a relatively straight uh, forward scenario, again, where we just have a private purchaser and a private provider. So I start off in private healthcare and any kind of additional services that I receive are also private. So um, four and one are basically pretty straightforward. And one, we are entirely public. And four, we are entirely private. But the confusing ones are really much more two and three. And um, especially with the pandemic, um, three increased a lot, scenario three. Um, so the private providers um, were often not able to provide all the services, partly because maybe they weren't locked down, they weren't allowed to open at the time. So they had to send their patients on to public providers, where, but where we had to pay the public provider and um, use the full economic costing. So... Um, and so two and three are sort of the more tricky scenarios where the competition becomes more problematic. Um, like I said, this all became more complicated with COVID-19. Um, so one thing that the government did was to relax the competition rules and actually allow the providers, for example, to have collusions and to cooperate together to be able to deal with the pandemic and the, the public health emergency. Um, they had certain orders for that. They had the 2020 order, which was revoked in 2021, and then had, they had a new 2022 order um, for the Omicron variant, um, where again, they allowed the providers to work together. And this has been criticized a lot, um, not the initial order so much, but the 2022 order, because they were saying that um, it's actually, they... Um, the providers weren't really doing this because of the pandemic, but because there was already a lot of backlog in the system. And now they were just trying to um, use this cooperation and use the fact that competition law doesn't apply to them 
anymore for the moment um, to sort of deal with the backlog that they already had. So that was highly criticized. Um, another thing that happened during the pandemic is that um, when we have a merger, I already explained when we have a merger between two healthcare providers, this can be investigated by the competition commission. And um, But the secretary of state can intervene if there's a public interest in that merger. And so what the question then is, what is a public interest? And there are a variety of things that can count as a public interest. And since COVID-19, um, a health emergency would also count as a public interest. So the Secretary of State can now allow mergers due to the pandemic that would normally be anti-competitive. Um, so there were some changes with COVID-19 that made um, sort of anti-competitive behavior a bit easier for a while during the pandemic to deal with that um, health emergency. Um, however, more generally, the uh, Competition Commission is not entirely happy with how the healthcare market works in the UK. Um, so recently they have, um, for example, done a market investigation into the uh, hospital sector. And they realized that the private hospitals actually at the moment face very little competition because um, there are not so, like I said, there are not so much private hospitals in Liverpool, which is, Liverpool is a big city, but I think we only have one private hospital here. So if you were to go private, then that's where you have to go. You don't have any choice. Um, so they then decided, the, the Competition and Markets Authority then decided that it would be good if actually there was some divestiture. So if they would split up some of the private hospitals so that they would face more competition. But there was judicial review and that was considered as disproportionate. So they introduced some other remedies now. So um, giving performance information to patients and um, uh, sort of incentives to referring to crackdown on incentives to referring to private clinicians in particular from the NHS side. So <clears throat> that the private providers can't give basically any kind of reward or cashback or something to um, other uh, hospitals, in particular to public hospitals or public uh, doctors, to refer them to the private hospital. So that's some measures that they've now introduced instead. Um, but I think the, the point that remains is um, that we have this sort of semi-privatized system with these rather complicated arrangements um, where competition is sometimes taking place, sometimes not, sometimes sort of mixed. And um, it's not necessarily working overly well, um, the competition within this. And obviously there are questions around it. Should there even be competition in this area or should we focus on something else in healthcare? Is competition really the important thing or is the, 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 the service, the trust, the, the, is that the more important thing? So that's the one side of the coin. But the other side is also that if we do introduce competition, then a competition also needs to be working um, because otherwise we have kind of the worst of all worlds. We don't have the public system anymore, but we also don't really have a proper competitive system. So um, this is why this will remain probably a focus area of the competition authorities um, that will have to look further into how this market can be made to work better. Um, so to summarize, um, initially the UK would have been part of all the things that I've been saying about the EU in the beginning. But um, then Brexit happened, and since the transition period ended at the 1st of January 21, um, the, the EU and the UK are not separate. Um, the main thing at the EU level is that EU competition law applies to national healthcare, so the uh, countries like Spain, Germany, the Netherlands, and so on, can't do whatever they want in their healthcare system because as soon as they introduce market elements and as soon as the providers become undertakings, it will be scrutinized by EU competition law. And sometimes that can require them to further commodify than they initially wanted to, because once they started introducing market elements, then they really have to assure that it's actually competitive so the EU can force them to further commodify. Um, now, the U UK system is um, separate. The UK system is one of the most marketized systems in uh, the EU or 
obviously now it's not in the EU anymore, but in Europe, um, because in Europe, traditionally, this is much more publicly provided. Um, but the UK started to marketize the system very early. Um, so now we have a sector regulator, NHS Improvement, that uh, sits next to the competition authority and which are both responsible to supervise the competition in that sector. We've seen there are several different scenarios of how competition may or may not enter into this. And um, it's basically quite tricky and there's um, essentially still quite a lot of work to do for uh, the competition authorities in this area. Um, so yeah, that would be my presentation. So I'm happy to take any questions if I can. Thank you, Andrea. That's a long uh, exp uh, explanation, but um, to summarize it, it's um, I think I like the ones in UK better than in <laughs> because you don't have to pay, isn't it? You pay from the um, uh, tax. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in, yeah. in Germany, for example, it's actually similar. Um, we pay, pay into the public insurance, of course, but uh, we don't realize that it's taken off our money, off our salary, just like taxes. So you never actually have that money and then have to pay. It's so it's compulsory. It... So, so at the end of the day, it's kind of the same. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, how much is the tax in, in, in England? How uh, much? It is... It is 20% um, oh. if you earn less than, I think, 38,000. If you earn more then than that, it's 40%. Okay, so it's almost the same as it is in Indonesia. So, But um, in here, uh, the, the healthcare system, we you either pay by privately or insurance, you pay privately again, or uh, you pay for the BPJS. So it's yeah. it's quite different. You have to pay for your health, so it's mm -hmm. not deducted from the tax, mm -hmm. which is in which is I think it's better in UK. Okay, all right, um, uh, students. Um, I know, um, this is something new for us because, uh, in faculty of law, uh, healthcare, uh. Law is just we just deliver it this semester. I don't know about in in uh, faculty of uh, FKM, but uh, if you have any questions, please uh, please raise your hands or you can write it down on the chat. Is there any questions? Ada yang mau ditanya enggak? Jadi uh, sebenarnya di sistem di UK itu uh, di Eropa Union di Eropa sekarang itu lebih pada ada sebenarnya uh, kompetisinya di uh, bagian health services ini karena mereka ada yang namanya uh, pembayaran um, asuransi kesehatan, cuman asuransi dan wajib punya asuransi kesehatan. Hanya saja asuransi kesehatannya itu dia bukan pajak, tapi kalau di uh, Inggris um, healthcare-nya itu dibayar melalui pajak, sehingga tidak perlu lagi bayar asuransi kesehatan. Nah masalahnya itu adalah apakah mereka ada kompetisinya? Kalau di uh, Inggris malah sedikit sekali kompetisinya. Tapi kalau di Amerika, di Eropa ada kompetisi itu sehingga diatur. Nah di Indonesia kompetisi di bagian kesehatan ini antara ada dan tiada. Kenapa? Kalian bisa lihat kita bayar asuransi BPJS maupun asuransi kesehatan biasa atau bayar. Berarti kita harus bayar kan untuk kesehatan tidak ada dipotong dari pajak ya kan? Nah kemudian bagian bagi kita mendapatkan uh, servis berdasarkan berapa yang kita bayar. Ya kan? Ada yang bayar murah dapat hari kelasnya rendah, bayar mahal dapat kelasnya tinggi. Jadi berbeda. In 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 UK for example, do you have that kind of classes for a healthcare or just the same? In here for example in Indonesia, if you pay more, then you get better services probably, but 
usually you get better services. If you have paid less, then you get less services. What about in UK? No, everybody gets exactly the same. So you can't, in the public hospitals, you can't pay more to get a better service. So for example, once I had my daughter, I asked, can I pay more to get a private room? <laughs> And they said no. So I had to be in a bit big ward with a lot of babies and a lot of mothers, which uh, made sleeping very difficult. So <laughs> there is, so there is nothing like in here. You've been in Kupang. You stay in Kupang, is it? Yeah. Yeah. In here, if you want to go to a better doctor's, for example, well, you have to wait for. You just can't say, "I want to go to that doctor. I don't want this one." that near my house i want to go to that doctor and i pay more that's available in indonesia what about in uk no that is not available so um you have to go to the doctor that is near your house so there might be a few doctors near your house um that you can decide which one you want to go to but you can't just go to any doctor further away so you will have to i, I mean unless it's a private doctor then then it's different you can go do whatever you want and if you go to a private one but if you go to the public one you just have to go to the one that is um, in your catchment area and it's useful for everyone to use to do that yeah i mean, I mean like i said in some in some areas i mean Richer people in the very big cities like London and Manchester, they might go to private providers. But for example, in Liverpool, we just accept that one private hospital. We don't have any private providers. So um, we don't have any private uh, pediatricians, for example, for, for children or um, even private dentists or anything. You know, they are, they are just the public ones. You just have to go to them. And um, they're not always necessarily very good, but you have to just go to them because that, that's the only thing that is available. Okay, now there is a question from Hamidi. Uh, in UK healthcare system, is there a PBM or equivalent? Right now, so many cases involving PBM in the US. Is it also the same in UK? Uh, so, so what is PBM? I'm not familiar. With I'm not so sure. Uh, Pak Hamidi, can you explain what PBM is stands for? Pak Hamidi? Ah, Pharmacy Benefit manage Manager. Okay, um, I mean, with, with the pharmacies, it's um they are they tend to be private um often they are actually located within the supermarket and um the our gp will just send um the um prescription to the pharmacy and then at the pharmacy uh we have to pay uh the sort of regular like everybody has to say, pay the same price it's about um 10 pounds for a for uh, one prescription. So if you need two medicines, then it's about 20 pounds, um, unless you're uh, exempted from paying. So for example, children under the age of 18 don't have to pay, pregnant women don't have to pay, and um, people, poorer people who have less money don't have to pay, but everybody else has to pay about 10 pounds per prescription. And, um, but if you want to just buy something privately, then you just pay the normal price. So for example, if uh, you just have a cough, you might not necessarily go to the doctor because you just think, oh, well, it's just a cough. I'm just going to go and get some cough serum. Then you just have to pay whatever it costs. And that might be more or less than, than the 10 pounds. Um, so I don't know if that's what you meant. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. But Hamidi, is, that, is the questions being answered or thank you? All right, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Jocelyn? Yes. Okay, go ahead, Jocelyn. Okay, then. Um, I want to ask, uh, what, what if you have uh, your own private insurance? Is it an obligation to pay for your um, public health care by um, cutting off your um, salary for taxes? That's all. Uh, yeah, I mean, in particular in England, because it's tax based, you just pay your taxes, you don't exactly know what your taxes are used for. So maybe my taxes have been used to make 
to fix the road somewhere and someone else's taxes have gone into the healthcare system. They're not earmarked, so you don't know where they go to. So you can't just not pay, um, you, you can't just not pay taxes. You always have to pay taxes and they use them for whatever they want to use them. You don't know where they go. You just know that the healthcare system is somehow funded from them, but you can't not pay that. Um, and so for example, in Germany, where's the public insurance, Everybody also has to be in that, and it kind of works similar than, than the tax system because it also just goes off your, your salary. So you don't have to pay it yourself in the same way. But there, if you earn over a certain maximum amount, um, you can opt out because um, basically they make sure that if you really want to opt out of the system, you have to be able to afford it so that not at the end of the day, you, you be there and have no health care. So if you really earn quite a lot over a quite high threshold in Germany, then you can opt out and then you wouldn't have to pay that bit anymore for, to, to the government, but instead you can have a private insurance. But that is very rare um, in, in Germany and in England, it's an entirely not possible to opt out. Um, and the only way you can opt out is basically you don't use the public health care and you pay privately, but that doesn't mean you have to pay less taxes or anything. Thank you. But I would be interested to also hear a bit more uh, about how the Indonesian, how the, the public health insurance in Indonesia works. Um, does the money come off your salary directly or do you pay it later? Or... Uh, so, sorry, you are um, muted. Sorry. For, well, for the BPJS, you actually mandatory to have a BPJS, but not everybody is paying it because uh, is having a BPJS because you need to pay. Mm -hmm. And it did, it did not there is no connection between your salary and the or the pay the money that you earn and the BPJS. You have to pay it separately. Okay. So it doesn't so then cut some off. people might just not do it. Yes. Right. So, okay. And there are um what I say, um assumption from most of the people that BPJS is the worst case scenario for healthcare. So many of us did not pay for the BPJS or, or just ignore it. So mm -hmm. they pay uh, another health ins insurance or just pay it by, you know, directly. Out of pocket. Yes. So anyway, anyway, any kind of scenario for insurance or non-insurance for healthcare is just the same. You have to pay from your pocket, not from the tax that you have paid. And the more you pay, the better you got. Mm -hmm. The less you pay, the less services you got. And also, that's also included for all kinds of services for healthcare. So, in your opinion, for the, well, I like the UK because you don't have to pay anymore. <laughs> But in your opinion, which one is better, the EU type or the UK type in, in terms of services? Because we know that competition makes better services, isn't it? For uh, yeah, I, I, I guess it depends because I think, like I said, the, the system in Germany is also largely public. It's also a public system and it works quite well. Um, the public system in the UK works less well. <laughs> so like I said, the services aren't always, they, they are free, um, but they aren't always very good. There are really long waiting times. Mm -hmm. So um, one time, for example, I hurt my wrist and I needed to have like a scan. And um, it took so long to see the specialist that by the time it had healed by itself, because it took nine months to actually be able to see the specialist and it just got better by itself. So, um, yeah, so wow. that's how long sometimes the waiting time is. And obviously not, not if it's an emergency, but if it is something that is just sort of unpleasant, then it can be a really long waiting time before anything got done. And um, the sort of the emergencies and rooms and things like that, they always very, very full. So one time my daughter was sick and we went to the walk-in, the children walk-in center 
and we were waiting like five hours or something until she was seen so it's it's not work very well the public system but i think that's less of an issue about whether it's public or private it's just a bit of an issue that they've been cutting the funding a lot so mm. um, because it's funded from taxation and not from anything that is sort of earmarked like a public insurance or something which is earmarked you know that money is for the healthcare sector but when you just have taxation they can use the taxes for whatever they like so and if they have another priority the, the current government certainly has other priorities than the healthcare system, then you just cut the funding and cut the funding. And then you have the situation where you have like really long waiting times and not very great services. Well, that happens everywhere. I think you have you just have to choose one way or another. Yeah. Uh, is there any other questions, students? Okay, Pam. Me. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Pakar. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, hello, Andrea. Uh, I'm Carl Tambulun. I want to ask you uh, a question about uh, low, per pers low per perspective. Are there uh, some uh, boilerplate clauses, boilerplate clauses, or standard from agreement? in her health uh, system health card in England. Um, sorry, I'm not quite sure what, what kind of standard agreement do you mean between the agreement between whom? Oh, be, 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 between uh, uh, the, the insurance, uh, between insurance and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the people who join the insurance. Um, uh, like I said, in England, we don't have an insurance. It's funded by taxation. Okay, 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 okay. Well, in, we don't actually have an insurance. How, how about with the private uh, sec sector, private uh, Edgar? Uh, yes, the, for the private sector, it's actually a bit, um, it's also a bit uncommon that people have the insurance for that. I think the people who can afford to pay the private sector, they just go to this private sector and pay some people have like an add-on insurance on the public sector so they have um some addition if they pay some money and then they can get some additional treatments for for example dentistry because dentistry is even though it's public um usually you have to pay a lot yourself so um if you need a root canal for example um you have to pay 500 pounds yourself even in the public system um, so some people have a bit of an insurance as an add-on to to that. Um, so uh, that that for example, if even though you have the public uh, providers, um, that you don't have to pay this additional five hundred pounds. So some some people have an insurance for that, but it's not actually very common to to have additional insurance because most people just use the free um, system. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Pak Carl. Yes, Pak uh, Carl is one our of our uh, doctorate um, students, and he's working. He's working his thesis now for tax. Uh, what is that? Tobacco tax uh, cases. Okay. Customs, is there customs, any other questions? Yeah. Yes, would it? Yes. Um, okay. So, so first of all, I'm really yes, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'm really sorry if I misheard this. But what what I heard is there's a certain uh, sector regulator in the UK. Is that right? So uh, I have I have tried to find what what does the sector regulator does, and I don't I can I just can't find it. What it's called and what does it, it actually do? So what I'm asking here is uh, what does it exactly do and um, like if there are like a certain limits for the sector regulator then uh, what does it do and what are the limits yeah that's my question uh, so firstly the sector regulator is called NHS improvement I'm sorry can you repeat the, it so the public health service the public health service in uh, England it's uh, basically called national health service so it's oh. NHS and the sector regulator is called NHS Improvement. 
and um, they work together with, I mean, they, they do a lot of things within the healthcare sector, um, also some forms of sort of quality and so on assurance. Um, but that's not my area, so I can't say too much about this. Um, in terms of competition law, they work together with the um, normal competition authority, which is called CMA, um, Competition and Market Authority. Um, they work together to check um, that the competition is working in the healthcare sector, insofar as we have competition like within those four scenarios. And um, like I said, the, the one of the things they've recently been doing is a market study. So they've just been study, like checking out the market, studying to see if um, there are any issues. And I did think there were problems around um, lack of competition for private hospitals because there are just not very many. Um, and then they made recommendations on that basis. Uh, thank you. So um, can I confirm? So in that uh, in H A N H S, there's like a, another uh, certain def, uh, section that does that does uh, regulate for the competition law or does the NHS does it like uh, generally? No, that, uh, it's, it's confusing with how it's called. But NHS improvement is actually entirely separate from the NHS. It is the, the body that monitors the NHS. They check up on them, but they're not part of them. Okay. So they're completely separate. They work together with the competition authority. They're basically a competition authority, but particularly focused on healthcare. And they work together with the normal competition authority to check the competition in the healthcare market. Oh, okay, I understand. Thank you. Okay, is there any other questions? Dari FKM ada yang mau nanya? Dari Panca Budi ada yang mau nanya? Okay, Andrea, I think... Um... We can conclude our uh, meetings for today. Thank you for your share of knowledge. We hope that we are going to meet again in the future. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And it was nice to give this presentation to you. I know it's probably quite a bit out of what you are normally studying. So I hope it wasn't too fast or anything. Um, I try to keep it <laughs> accessible, but um, it is a lot to take in. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. Prof Ningru. Yes, I'm right here. Devi, can you ask to somebody to take our um, uh, pictures on the uh, on the uh, uh, screen? Okay. Yeah. Okay.